Growing up, my mom was a Jehovah Witness and my dad was a Christian. And so that brought a lot of attention into my family. Um, and so that kind of led to a divorce. And from there, I kind of shied away from the church. I grew up going to church off and on. My family on both sides, we were Christians and I believed, but my heart wasn't aching for the things that God's heart aches for. Between then and when we came back to First Christian, I just felt like I had a lot of people placed in my life to guide me back to God. And then when we moved back to this area, Anthony and I did and got married, my parents started attending First Christian on a regular basis. And we started going to church here again. The more we came back, the more we got to know everybody and all the staff is when we figured out that First Christian was the place we wanted to be. What they believe here is modeled so much. It's not just about coming to church on Sunday, it's about so much more than that. When we first started, the people who were about our age, they invited us to come over on weekends to play games, and they all want to get to know you, get to know your story, know who you are, your background. I never experienced that through the church. We really liked how everything that they teach here is based off the Bible, and so I really connected with that because I felt like, well, I can believe in this. This is something that God gave us as a tool to use, and that's what is supposed to guide us. So it's not anyone twisting it in a certain way or how they feel, it's what the Bible says, and that was important for me. What Jed provides in his lessons, I can translate those from that day into the week and going into my classroom on a Monday and praying for a, a staff member who might have had a rough weekend when First Christian provides those encouraging words that I can take from here to my classroom, First Christian can help them in their lives. Through the sermons and through things that we've learned at church, it's just helped us reevaluate what is important and how we use our resources. And sometimes it feels like you don't have a lot to share, but when you really reevaluate what God's purposes are for your life and what you really need, you might be able to share more than you think you will. When I hear the word unimaginable, I, I think of endless possibilities with the church and the things that they can provide for not only the people inside the church, but the communities around Council Bluffs, around Omaha. When I hear unimaginable, I think of our church being a place where people see us outside the church and think, Something's different about that person or those people. And showing God's love and really extending that out to everyone you see in a radical way. We know what a great place it is and we know if people start to come here, they will want to keep coming. And so we hope that that continues to happen and we have more kids where we teach at that know the love of Christ. For me, that's what makes First Christian worth it. Can you celebrate that with me? Yeah. So good to see what God is doing here in the lives of people. And, you know, if you're just joining us, we are in the middle of a message series called Unimaginable, and we're dreaming about what God can and wants to do in the days ahead through this community. And we're in week three. And today we have a unique opportunity to hear from a great friend and a great leader in our movement of churches, Gene Apple from Anaheim, California. Um, when I asked Gene to join us for this week, uh, he was grateful for, to do it, but we didn't see the forecast yet, okay? And so he just left Anaheim to come here in the middle of February, and we're grateful for that. Now, a couple of things I told you last week, you know, uh, Super Bowl just got done being played, all right? Uh, LA Rams went up uh, against the New England Patriots, and we still aren't celebrating the outcome of that publicly, but I'm just letting you know it happened, okay? And <clears throat> Gene and I will go out to lunch, and, and we'll figure out who the winner is and who gets to pay, but um, no, so grateful for him. He's a great encourager in our lives. I was talking with him last week, and he had an opportunity to talk to his mother who reminded him, this is a great story, reminded him that in 1949, when his parents were just getting going in ministry, his dad's a pastor, he received a call to come to Council Bluffs, his father did, to interview for a job in 1949. 
So they got on a train and came to Council Bluffs, and Gene said, I could have been a Council Bluffs boy. Instead, they uh, relocated to Illinois. That's where he was born and raised and um, has been a leader in a number of churches here uh, throughout the Midwest and then also now in the East Coast in Anaheim. And we're so grateful for him. And so would you do me a favor and welcome Gene Apple to the stage with me? <clears throat> I didn't know Anaheim was East Coast. <laughs> Let's see. Thanks. Good morning. You have no idea how honored I am to be at First Christian today, and I have been a fan of this church, and I'm a big fan of your pastor, and uh, just celebrating all the good things that God is doing, and man, when you can leave Anaheim and count to Council Bluffs on a snowy day in February, who wouldn't want to do that, right? <laughs> who wouldn't want to do that? So greetings from Anaheim, home of the uh, Ducks hockey team, Angels baseball team, and Mickey Mouse, and uh, the, the most expensive, I mean, happiest place on earth is in Anaheim, and uh, most of you I know have never heard me speak before, so I'll just get this out of the way. Every time I go someplace to speak, people ask me, Gene, is that your real voice? I know. Do you really sound that way? And Like, I'd give an audio team a hundred bucks if they could make me sound like Barry White or something, you know, <laughs> kind of, Jesus loves your baby, something like that. <laughs> but instead, when God was handing out voices, I got one that sounds like I've been inhaling helium for four days. So uh, that's what you're stuck with today, okay? So this is such an exciting time in the life and the story of this church because I really believe many of you are going to look back years from now and say that was a defining moment in my life, that was a defining moment in the story of First Christian that God is writing. Uh, how do I know that? Because I've been through similar kinds of generosity initiatives that you're in right now multiple times in my life. I was a pastor for 18 years in Las Vegas. And uh, most people are surprised to hear there's churches in Las Vegas, right? You know, Las Vegas church sounds like an oxymoron, you know, like uh, two words that don't go together, you know, like white chocolate or jumbo shrimp or uh, Microsoft Works. And uh, I... Uh, I wondered, you know, what's church in Las Vegas going to be like? Are they going to have an Elvis impersonator doing a prelude and girls in bikinis announcing hymn numbers, you know, kind of like uh, <laughs> fight night, tithe machines in the lobby, you know, what's it going to be like? But a number of years ago when uh, I was the pastor of Central Christian Church in Las Vegas, we started praying and dreaming about a relocation project to a much larger site. And... Uh, so the first prayer that we had was to start a new church, and, and we sent 600 of our people to launch a new church in the northwest part of the Las Vegas Valley. And then several months later, we went into a, a generosity initiative where people were asked to give over and above their regular giving over the next three years so that we could buy land for a relocation project. And at the time, we didn't have... Uh, any property. At the time, we didn't even have drawings of buildings. We had nothing more than faith and a prayer that God could do something, uh, possibly, uh, if we committed to this cause. And that night, we, we had a banquet at a local on a hotel on the Las Vegas Strip. We had a dinner, and about a thousand people from our church attended. And that night, they made a commitment over the next three years to give above and beyond their regular giving $3 million dollars so that we could buy land. Now, you want to know an ironic twist of God's providence. The hotel where we had that dinner doesn't even exist anymore. It went the way that all hotels in Las Vegas eventually go kaboom, and uh, they blew it up. And they built a new hotel on that site that you've heard of called the Mandalay Bay. We eventually bought property out on the southeast part of town that was a quarry that was 80 acres large but it, because it had been a quarry, it had to be built up before you could build on it. And here's kind of the ironic twist of God's providence. Before we build, we, could, we had to build it up, and we had 70,000 truckloads. Imagine that. 70,000 truckloads of dirt were brought in from the site of the Mandalay Bay Hotel that was donated free so we could build our church property there. Isn't that like only God that could orchestrate a story like that. It was an exciting time in the church because everybody was involved and everybody sacrificed. Children set up lemonade stands. Families had garage sales. Some cashed out 401ks. Some people sold uh, 
building lots that they were going to build a, a custom home on. Some had commercial real estate that they donated. A man walked into my office one day, and uh, he had some stock certificates with him. And he said, Gene, my dad bought these stock certificates in General Electric in the 1930s. And before he died, he gave them to me. And he said, son, I want you to do something really important with these someday. And he said, I think this vision and this project is that important thing that God wants to do. You say, well, what happened because of that initiative? Was, was it worth it? Well, you tell me. The campus that we started in the northwest part of the valley when we sent 600 people to launch it has grown to over 6,000 people every weekend in worship attendance. That church that we, we relocated to that 80 acres that I told you about now has over 15,000 people at that site every weekend. Last year, they baptized over 2,300 people. So let me ask you, do you think that was a good kingdom investment? You know what I can tell you? It was unimaginable. As big as our dream was that God would do something significant, it was unimaginable to us that He could do something like that as a result of our prayers and sacrifices and faithfulness. And I believe that's going to be a similar story and that when many of you look back to this season in your life and this season in the life of your church, you're going to say, we had no idea the lives that God would touch, it was just unimaginable. One time the Apostle Paul wrote a church, it's in the New Testament, in the city of Colossae. The city of Colossae. Interesting, Colossae was not a church that Paul had ever visited. It was not a church where he had spoken at. It's not a church that he had founded. Everything he knew about that church was based on rumor. It was based on reputation. It was based on what other people were saying about the church. And do you know what that church was known for? Do you know what the reputation of that church was? They had the reputation of being a faithful church. Paul even begins the letter in verse 2 of Colossians 1 with these words. He says, To God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. The faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. It's what they were known for. Sometimes I wear contact lenses, and a while back I was having trouble. Every time I'd put my contact lenses in, everything would be fuzzy and blurry, and I'd get up to speak in church services, and I couldn't read my notes, and I couldn't read my Bible, and very frustrating. And uh, one weekend before our Saturday night service, the thought hit me, I'm embarrassed to admit this, but the thought hit me. I wonder if somewhere along the line I've gotten my lenses switched and I'm putting the lens that's supposed to go in my right eye and my left eye and the lens that's supposed to go in my left eye and my right eye. And I thought, what the heck? I'm just going to switch them around and see what happens. Well, it was amazing how much better I could see at that moment. <laughs> I saw things with such new precision and new clarity, and I got to thinking about it, and I thought, you know, that's what happens to many churches sometimes. We get our lenses switched, and instead of being outward focused, we get inward focused. Instead of being inclusive of people who are far from God, we become exclusive toward people who are far from God. Instead of being faithful in the church, we get unfaithful in the church, and it's like we get our lenses switched. And then once in a while, a church comes along like First Christian that has had 125 years of impact in ministry. You know, the history of this church is nothing short of magnanimous, and I want you to know what is happening in this church is not normal. Something extraordinary is going on here and supernatural that very few churches ever experience. It's not normal for a church to have over 1,300 worshipers every Sunday. The average church in the U.S., most churches have less than 100. It's not normal to baptize 90 people in the course of a year. Last year, half of all churches in the U.S. didn't add one new member by conversion. Think about that. It's not normal for a church that is 125 years old to declare that as great as our history is, we believe that our best days, our greatest days for God are still in front of us. And friends, I just hope you never lose the magnitude of the miracle of what God is doing in this church. I hope you never lose the wonder, the excitement, the sense of privilege that you have 
to be a part of something like this. Don't you agree? I mean, it, it, it's miraculous what you're a part of. But I also got to give you a sobering warning. There is no church in history that you can point back to that you can say they've been alive and dynamic and life-changing indefinitely. Did you notice Paul addressed the Colossians as the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ? Why? Because faithful churches are always made up of faithful individuals. So let me ask you, what do you think put the brothers and sisters in Colossae in the faithful category? In verses 3 and 4, Paul writes, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your what? Say it. Faith in Christ Jesus. He says we've heard of your faith. You see, faithful churches, churches like this one, are always made up of people who possess a passionate faith. Obviously, there was something extraordinary about the passion of their faith in Christ Jesus because he talks about it. You know, I've been a pastor for over 35 years, and one of the things that I've observed is that there are three types of people in every church. The first type of person is what I call uh, the drive through people. Maybe you look at this place as Mick Church kind of deal, you know? <laughs> you drive up on Sunday morning, and it's like, uh, yeah, uh, Welcome to First Christian. Can I take your order, please? Uh, yeah, I'd like a great service today and uh, inspiring music and fantastic children's ministries for my kids and a relevant practical message to my life. Would you like cheese with that? <laughs> Maybe some of you, you've just kind of been driving through church for a year or two or three and no real commitment, no real connection. You're a drive through person, no life change. Another type of person, a second type that I've noticed in every church is what I call the flu shot people. How many of you had a flu shot this year? Look at that. Yeah, I did too. I had a flu shot too. And I've noticed there are some people who approach their spiritual life like a flu shot. What happens when we get the flu shot? They're actually injecting a part of the virus inside of us so that we build up the antibodies to the flu. And I've noticed there are some people who approach their spiritual life uh, adventure like that, like they want just enough of God that they've got their fire insurance when they die, right? But they don't want the full-blown disease. They don't want the full-blown disease. Maybe you show up a couple times a month, shake a couple of hands, drop a couple of bucks in the offering uh, plate when it comes by, and then you're gone. So you've got a mild case of Christianity, but not the full-blown disease. Then there's a third group of people that I know are in every church, and that's what I call the committed core. And these are the people that make this church go. These are the people that you'll find in the trenches, on their knees, in prayer. These are the people that you'll find rolling up their sleeves and serving in the name of Jesus Christ. These are the people that you'll find giving generously. These are the people that open up their Bible and say, word of God, speak. These are the people who get in small groups and take off their mask and say, this is who I really am. This is what's going on in my life. These are not drive-through people looking for McChurch. These are not flu shot people looking for just enough of God that it prevents them from getting the full disease. But these are the committed core of this church. And I want to say to you who are a part of the committed core of First Christian, whether you've been around here 125 minutes or 125 days or 125 weeks or 125 years, thank you for year after year praying and serving and sacrificing and connecting and not getting weary in well-doing. And I can't help but wonder if this isn't the time in the life of this church where some of you are ready to say, you know what? It's time to leave my drive-through, flu-shot spiritual ways and to become a committed part of the core of this church. It's everybody time, gang. 100% engagement is needed at this time in the life of the church, and there's never been a more important time for that. A faithful church is marked by people who possess a passionate faith, and secondly, it's marked by people who extend an inclusive love. I want you to notice in verse 4 of this chapter, 
the last part of it, Paul says, we have heard of the love you have for all God's people. Paul says, this isn't a church with cliques. This isn't a church where you have to meet certain criteria to be part of the in crowd. When he says, you know, uh, all of God's people, with love for all of God's people, I picture a church with outstretched arms where it doesn't matter if you're young or old or rich or poor or black or white or Asian or Latino or blue collar or white collar. It's a love for all God's people. Back in 1985, I became the senior pastor of uh, Central Christian Church in Las Vegas. And when I arrived, they were facing a building expansion at their former location, and people were asked to give above and beyond their regular giving in an initiative over the next three years. And I really wrestled with what God wanted me to do. Did God come first place in my life or not? And I'll just be completely... (laughs) disclosing with you about my financial picture. I was 25 years old. I had a salary of $33,000 a year. Out of that, I was already tithing or giving a tenth of that to the church. I had a house payment and a car payment. I didn't have any benefits, so I was uh, paying for my own health insurance at the time, and there just wasn't a lot left. I barely had a savings account People would say, Gene, do you have a savings account? Oh, yeah, of course I got a savings account. There wasn't anything in it, but I had a savings account. And some of you can identify with that. And so I really wrestled with what God would have me do. And I I prayed God lead me in this. And I felt God leading me to give over and above my tithe over the next three years an additional $10,000 to that initiative. It took over 20% of my gross income during that time. Well, God used that three-year period in my life to teach me something about His faithfulness, to teach me something about sacrifice. My wife Barbara and I got married in early 1993, and two months later, our church launched into that initiative to buy land for a relocation project. And then three years later, we went into another initiative to build a building on the land that we bought. And in the first six years of our marriage, we made the kinds of financial commitments to those initiatives above and beyond our tithes that was many, many times greater than what I had given back in 1985. And we had to depend on God because the math just didn't add up for us. And it required some sacrifice and adjustments for us. We dipped into some retirement funds. We ate more pasta and ate out less. We didn't furnish our living room and dining room in our home. We didn't have a chair on the floor. We didn't have a picture on the wall. It was funny. People would come over to our house, and the big joke was, come on in and have a seat, because there weren't any. We were in above and beyond generosity initiatives most of the first 10 years of our marriage. And then I accepted a call to go to a church in California, and We went through another three-year initiative there for a relocation project, and Barbara asked me one day, so how many times do we get to make a -a once-in-a-lifetime sacrifice for God? (laughs) And maybe you wonder, Gene, why? Why would you and Barbara do that? Didn't you have your own challenges? Didn't you have your own financial needs? I know most of you, you don't know me and you don't know my story and my background. Right now in my life, this is a tremendously joy-filled, wonderful time for Barbara and I. We have three grown kids that are all married. We had our first grandchild in December. I'd be willing to show you pictures if you ask me. This is a great season in our lives, but it's not always been that way. Back in the 80s, both Barbara and I went through painful divorces through very similar circumstances. My ex-wife informed me that she was in love and involved with another man, and, and she left. And despite relentless attempts at reconciliation, she married the guy. And believe me, I know. I know it's only by the amazing grace of our great God that here I am standing here over 30 years later. I'll never forget my first Christmas alone again. We'd had our Christmas Eve services in Vegas, and My intent was to go through a drive-thru afterwards to grab something to eat, go home, do some laundry and pack, and I was going to catch a flight early Christmas morning back to Illinois to spend Christmas Day with 20 members of my family. 
And I got away from the church that night about 9.30 after our last Christmas Eve service. I drove down to a little chicken drive through restaurant to get something to eat, and they were closed. And I thought, no problem. I'll go next door. There was a little taco drive through place. Went over there, and they were closed. Well, what am I going to do now? Well, about a mile away, there was a jack-in-the-box. I was really getting desperate. And uh, so I drove over to jack-in-the-box, and jack-in-the-box was closed. And I thought, well, I'll go to my supermarket. My supermarket's open 24 hours a day. And I go to my supermarket. My supermarket was closed. I'd never seen Las Vegas, the city that never sleeps, so quiet. And it was an unusually cold and windy night in Las Vegas, and now I'm starting to feel sorry for myself, starting to have a little pity party, you know, oh, poor me, thinking about all the families having their little gatherings around the Christmas tree, and here I am all by myself. But I was determined to find something to eat because I was hungry. So I drove out to the east edge of Las Vegas where there's a country western theme casino called Sam's Town. And to my surprise, when I pulled up, the place was hopping. Parking lot was full. I walked in through the casino. There were people playing the slot machines and video poker machines and all the table games and everything. And I went upstairs to a 50-style diner and sat down at a table for four all by myself and ordered the blue plate special. It was like a bad dream. I remember thinking, I can't believe it. I just spoke for thousands of people, and here I am at Sam's Town on Christmas Eve eating meatloaf and mashed potatoes and gravy alone. And just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, somebody put a quarter in the jukebox, and Elvis started singing in my ear, Are you lonesome tonight? (laughs) Absolutely true. Not making that up. And By the way, your sympathy is very meaningful to me. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you so much. Well, I started laughing, actually, to myself, probably to keep from crying, and the thought that just overwhelmed me was, Gene, here you are, one of the most blessed guys in the world. You got more friends than should be legally allowed to have. You're flying home in the morning to spend Christmas Day with 20 members of your family. You got a church family that has stood with you through thick and thin, and if you of all people can be lonely tonight, imagine how difficult this night is for those who don't have anybody. And as I walked out of the casino that night, and again, watched all these people playing all the games, it was like the Holy Spirit just sent a dart right into my soul. And the message was, Gene, they don't have anywhere else to go tonight either. Why else would they be here on Christmas Eve? Friends, we've got to possess an inclusive love because I guarantee you, sitting among you right now, All throughout the Council Bluffs area, I guarantee you right now, there are people who are struggling just to hang on. There are people who are struggling to hang on to a marriage. There are people struggling to hang on to their sobriety. There are people who are struggling to keep their emotional equilibrium about them. There are single people, divorced people, widowed people who after church today are going to watch couples and families load up in their vehicles in the parking lot and it's just going to hurt a little bit. There are parents who are hurting over a son or a daughter that has greatly wounded them in their life. There are people who are struggling to hang on in the midst of financial pressures. There are people who are just trying to hang on to their business one more month. They're trying to hang on to their car one more month. They're trying to hang on to their house one more month. Friends, God needs churches that will extend an inclusive love, a love inclusive for people who are in need, a a love inclusive for people who are wounded, a love for people like Jean and Barbara Apple, because listen, I would not be standing here all these years later if it were not for a church that extended inclusive love for me. And friends, this is why. This is why Barbara and I have committed to do over and above generosity throughout our life because we know there's so many people in circumstances like we were at one time who need an inclusive love extended to them. As we read in our text, we find that a faithful church is marked thirdly by people who share a dynamic message. Notice these verses, verses 5 and 6 of Colossians 1. Paul says, The gospel that has come to you, the good news, the gospel, is bearing fruit and growing through the whole world, just as it has been, uh, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. 
Most Bible commentators agree that when Paul talks about the gospel bearing fruit and growing, he's talking about an ever-increasing number of people being transformed by the message of Jesus Christ. And friends, this is why I never worry, and you should never worry, if the church is getting too big. My guess is something Jed hears from time to time. I don't know, maybe some of you have even said or heard, because I've heard this over the years. People will say to me, don't you think the church is big enough now? Don't you think the church is like getting too big, Gene? And that always tickles me a little bit when I hear that from people because from the same people, let me ask you ladies a question. Have you ever said, I'm never going to go shopping at that shopping mall again because that place is just too big? Too big. Or any of you guys say, hey, you know, I'm never going to that uh, uh, Cabela's or Bass Pro Shop again because that place is just too big. No, we don't do that. Listen, a church that is in the midst of thousands, tens of thousands of people like you are should be big. If not, something is wrong because Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Listen, the problem is not that the church is getting too big. The problem is that hell is getting too big and too many people are going there. The problem is that 175,000 people die in our world every 24 hours and most are dying without the Son of God in their life. One person every three seconds. And whenever I meet a follower of Jesus who isn't concerned about reaching people who are far from God or who think their church is big enough, it just tells me one thing about them. They don't spend time enough rubbing shoulders and in relationship with people who are far from God because when you do, God keeps them right in front of you and it affects how you pray and it affects how you build relationships and it affects how you plan church services and it affects how you preach and it affects how you give. So if you'll allow me, I'd like to take a few moments and I'd like to talk to those of you who maybe find yourself in a position in your life, financially speaking, of great affluence. And that just may be a small percentage of those of you in this room. But no doubt, some of you here have worked very hard in your life and you've managed carefully and you have more today than you ever dreamed that you would. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with being wealthy as long as you leverage it right. But you know what studies say about the habits of wealthy followers of Jesus? That people with the most wealth proportionally give smaller amounts than those with medium or lower income levels. I remember the first time I ever asked somebody of means to consider a strategic gift. It was when we were in that process of buying land in Las Vegas, and I called a family in our church, and I asked them if they would Uh, if I could take them out to dinner and talk to them a little bit about the vision for the future of the church. And they said, oh, come over to our house. I thought, that would be great. We'll be on their turf. So we go over to their house for dinner, and we had a beautiful dinner, and I started casting the vision for the relocation project for the church. And this guy was a business guy, so right away his first question was, so how are you going to pay for it? And I said, I'm glad you asked that. And I said, we're going to have a you know, an over and above generosity initiative for three years for the church to buy the land. We hope to sell our current building in order to do that. But I said, I'm approaching a few families in the church right now to ask them if they would provide a strategic leadership gift to get started. And then I kind of gulped because I didn't know what this person's ability was. And I just said, would you, would you prayerfully consider a gift to help us get started of between 50000 and a million dollars? And he looked at me, and without missing a beat, he goes, you can count on us for a million. (laughs) And after I picked myself up off the floor, I thought, why didn't I ask for two million? (laughs) And we had this amazing conversation that night about what God could do through this. And and as I was leaving, I was out in front of their circular drive, getting into my vehicle, you know, just thanking them for dinner, thanking them for the conversation. Like a hundred times I'm thanking them. Then finally, I get into my Ford. My last comment to is, I said, and this is true, I'm not making that. I said, well, thanks a million. He goes, you mean that literally? I thought, oh, Gene, you dummy. I can't believe I just said that. (laughs) But friends, I saw the joy in that guy's life as God got more and more of his heart. And when that church in Vegas advanced in the years ahead and reached thousands of more people and brought hope to hurting people and started putting the right kinds of dreams in the hearts of young people, I know it gave him great fulfillment. 
You know what Jesus said, to whom much is given, much is required. And if God has blessed you with a level of wealth in this life, you're, you of all people ought to be the first one to run to your accountant or to run to your checkbook and say, oh God, I am part of a small percentage of people on planet earth that have the privilege to steward this kind of wealth and I will honor you and I will advance your causes. Now before I close, I want to say a word about your pastor, Jed. I've known Jed for several years. I have enormous respect for him. In fact, Jed, just stand up a minute, would you? Make you real awkward and uncomfortable. Just, just stand up. But here's what I want to say. There's not a person in this room, probably other than me, that understands the pressures of being the pastor of a church like First Christian. But I can tell you from day one a pa of a pastor's ministry, a pastor wonders, can God use somebody like me? With all my faults, with all my limitations, can God really use someone like me? Can I lead? Can I teach? Can I shepherd adequately? Will people respond and later as a church moves forward and expands, you're like, is this vision really from God or is this some kind of ego thing on my part and, and getting mixed up with pride and are we too far out on the limb of faith and what's the fine line between foolishness and faith? We wrestle with this stuff more than you think we would. And while all that's going on, there's a marriage to build into and kids to raise and a church staff to lead and sermons to prepare and broken people to comfort and naughty folks to straighten out and funds to raise and weary folks to encourage and toddlers leading an insurrection in the nursery and there are weddings to perform and funerals to conduct. Very, very few people appreciate the pressures of being a pastor of a church like First Christian. So I'm just, I'm just going to tell you that. And Jed, I'm sure there's been some dark nights of the soul for you as you've led here over the last several years. You came into an era in this church that had been kind of bumpy and a difficult time and challenging. And I'm sure it would have been so tempting over the last three years to say, heck with this. I'm going to walk away. But you didn't bail. You didn't cave in. You're still standing you're still full of faith, you're still married, you got kids that are nuts about you, and on behalf of everyone in this church, I want to honor you for being faithful in this church and leading into an unimaginable future. Let's bless Jed today, can we? Thanks, buddy. Okay, you can sit down. Paul had never been to Colossae. Everything he knew about that church was based on rumor, based on what others were saying about it. And you know what I wonder? I wonder if Paul were to hear rumors about First Christian Church five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 125 years from now, what kind of rumors he will hear. My prayer is that this will be a church that will always be marked by people who possess a passionate faith, who extend inclusive love, and who share a dynamic, life-changing message with those who need that hope. Let's be like that first group of 12 followers that came after Jesus. Stephen Curtis Chapman recalled, he said, nobody stood and applauded them. They knew from the start this road would not lead to fame. All they really knew for sure was Jesus had called to them. He said, come follow me, and they came. With reckless abandon, they came. Let's be like those first followers who said with Jesus, we will abandon it all for the sake of the call. No other reason at all but the sake of the call. Wholly devoted to live and to die for the sake of the call. Because we're the church. Let's be faithful till Jesus comes back. Amen? God bless all of you. It's been a privilege to be with you today. Thank you. I'm so 